Sabah al khair good morning. Sustainability and innovation, a conundrum. Sustainability is about preserving the world as it is today. Innovation is about creating new things that change the world. Can we have both, or must we choose between them? The answer is important to me personally. I'm a third generation bird watcher. My wife and I are avid gardeners. We have a strong case of biophilia, what Edmund Wilson calls uh, the love of life. He feels it's as much a part of our human nature as our opposable thumbs, and I wouldn't disagree. But at the same time, I'm a professor who teaches innovation, entrepreneurship, technology management. I'm a co-founder of a company that builds and launches spacecraft, a co-founder of a company that uses living plants to clean the environment, clean soil and water. So I have a strong belief that we can create things that make a difference in the world, that do good in the world. So I'd like to find a way to reconcile sustainability and innovation. I think we can do that, but we have to take a step back and look at sustainability perhaps in a slightly different way. Let me illustrate with a story. A climatologist, a geologist, and an astronomer walk into a restaurant. The climatologist sits down and opens a menu, but closes it quickly and says, I'm worried that we're not on a sustainable path. The number of species extinctions is increasing, Sea levels are rising now or soon will. The geologist looks at him sadly and says, it's much worse than that. Eventually, a new ice age will descend. Glaciers will come down as far south as Boston. We have super volcanoes that occur periodically in the Earth's history. Another one will lay down lava that will cover an entire continent. The astronomer says, you haven't considered the worst of it. We have dinosaur killer asteroids out there. They come down periodically. One of those would wipe out every form of animal life larger than a gerbil. She says that's not the worst of it. When the sun goes into its red giant phase, all of the atmosphere will be blown away. All of the oceans will evaporate. Every single atom of life on this planet will disappear there will be nothing left. So life on Earth faces a deadline that has nothing to do with humans. This is a rather grim story. It illustrates two things. The first is a question, and that is, how far in the future should we try to be sustainable? Is 10 years enough? Is 100 years adequate? Or should we be planning to keep things sustainable until the next big meteor impact? This is an important question. I think we can answer it a little bit better in just a second, so I'll return to it. The other thing this story illustrates is that sustainability is not simply a matter of some things being sustainable and other things being unsustainable. That's, I think, dramatically oversimplified. What we need is a spectrum of sustainability and to create that, I think it's useful to consider what I'll call an index of sustainability. It looks a lot like a Richter scale. We take the length of time that something is expected to exist or live. We convert that to a base 10 logarithmic number, just like the Richter scale. So if something survives for 10 years, it has an index of 1 something that survives for 100 years, 10 to the 2 years, has an index of 2. On this scale, some familiar things have very short numbers. The sustainability of the petroleum industry, if it keeps maintaining production at about its current level for 50 years, would have an index of 1.7, the log of 50. The sustainability of the Roman Empire, 
which lasted 680 years, would have a sustainability of 2.8. The average biological species, which survives about 6 million years before it goes extinct, would have a survivability index of 6.8. And from today, the survivability of all life on this planet, unless we do something, is 9.5. Now, how can we use this scale? I'd compare it to another scale, which was created in 1964 by a Soviet astronomer, Nikolai Kardashev. He ranked civilizations according to how much energy they used. So a type one civilization on his scale used all of the energy that a sun emitted on a single planet. A type two civilization used all the energy of that sun. And a type three civilization used all the energy produced by all the stars in a galaxy. Now this is a vast scale. Our own civilization fails to meet even the bottom rung of a type one civilization. We don't use all the energy that falls on the planet, but it's kind of within hailing distance. This scale was used to measure the power, the reach of a civilization. I think we can use the sustainability index to measure the wisdom or maturity of a civilization. So if a civilization is really grappling with problems that it faces over the next few years or tens of years, that's pretty much a level one civilization. A civilization looking farther in the future, hundreds of years, is level of two. And a civilization that is contending with the red giant phase of the sun or galactic collisions, that's a level nine civilization. Our own civilization is kind of a mishmash. We're worried about things that are happening here and now. Sometimes we have to worry about things like that. But we also, in addition to being a level one civilization, worry about what will happen in a million years with nuclear waste. That's a level six civilization type of concern. So we haven't fixed all the problems yet that will allow us to call ourselves a level six civilization. We're still in this uncomfortable transition. As we get wiser, as we get more mature, we'll be able to put aside the shorter term worries and focus more on the long term. So coming back to the question, how far in the future should we look? The answer is, it depends on our sustainability index as a civilization. The wiser we are, the more mature we are, the more we look at the longer term issues. And eventually, I hope, we'll be worried at how do we sustain life beyond the red giant phase of the universe. Perhaps our level nine descendants someday will switch out the sun the way we might today switch out a light bulb. But how do we get to that exalted state? In a word, innovation. Innovation is what brought much of the developed world from a life expectancy on the order of less than 40 years to a level today approaching 80 over the span of 160 years, doubling life expectancy. That's doubling sustainability of people in those countries. That's a tremendous achievement. So innovation is one of the answers. Innovation can be thought of as the way that a civilization increases its sustainability and the sustainability of everything it cares about. That's a very deep concept. Other species can't get there. Innovation is of many types, uh, biological, technological, political, social. Many of the problems facing us today have little to do with technology. We think of a billion people who have no electricity today, or the billion people who lack adequate nutrition or the billion people who have too much nutrition. Those problems require primarily political and social innovation. So how do we get that? Are we worried about consequences? For example, if we innovate and solve the problem of world hunger, 
Doesn't that mean just a lot more people using a lot more resources? I think there the answer is uh, we're human beings. And to be true to ourselves, we have to help everyone on this planet attain a decent standard of living. E.O. Wilson says that's the primary challenge we face in the 21st century, to raise everybody everywhere to a decent standard of living while protecting as much of the rest of life as possible. Unfortunately, innovation is a messy and inefficient process. It has costs. In nature, innovation takes place through natural selection, Darwinian evolution, red in tooth and claw. That's messy. In the business world, corporate chieftains will sometimes exhort their R&D staffs to only work on the projects that will succeed and not on the other projects. But that's like telling bettors at a racetrack, only bet on the horses that will win. It's an appealing strategy, but it's much easier said than done. So innovation is not only messy and inefficient, it's unpredictable. And that means we have to be very careful about the constraints, the limits that we place on innovation. Because it's so easy to kill an idea early on. Even great ideas are very vulnerable in their earliest stages. And it takes a lot of effort and commitment to bring these, in, these ideas, these new products, into a world that is just as happy without them initially. So we need to make sure that we have the right environment for innovation, and that is called the innovation ecosystem. And this is the message I want to leave you with today. The innovation, innovation ecosystem is that complex web of resources and relationships, just like a biological ecosystem, that hosts, that houses individual innovations. It is uh, comprised of stakeholders and rules. And what we find today, unfortunately, is that innovation is getting harder. The reason is, in large part, that all of the rules and regulations, all of the guidelines, all the benchmarks, the best practices, the review boards, all of these things we've set up that make our world cleaner and safer and more predictable also have unintended consequences. They can make it harder to innovate. They can make it very difficult to navigate through shoals of paperwork or permits or permissions, making sure that folks are okay with what you're doing. All of that distracts the innovator in that little moment when the idea is springing forth. And that's not a good thing. So we need to think of ways to make the innovation ecosystem around the world friendlier to innovators, to make it easier to innovate. And I think that what we should look at doing is creating innovation safe harbors, places on the world where innovators can go and innovate very quickly, very cheaply. These innovation safe harbors could be as small as a garage, or they could be as large as a country. I think that countries will have definite advantages if they can follow this concept and make it easier to innovate within their borders, because innovation is a key not only to sustainability, but to national wealth. Increasingly, as we work towards a knowledge-based economy around the world, innovation will be central to success. So we don't have the luxury of time. You've heard that species extinctions are rising, that we've passed a milestone in global warming with atmospheric CO2, and I've raised some new worries for you today uh, in the long term. These rare global catastrophes that are not likely to happen for tens of thousands, tens of millions, billions of years, but many of them could happen next year. So the question is, should we really assume that we have the time or not? Do we feel lucky? Do we feel lucky? I think it's not 
part of our responsibility as humans to assume that we will be lucky and let our descendants worry about these problems. So let's get to work, let's innovate, let's improve the innovation ecosystem, let's innovate faster, and I think if we create a better future, then we will not have to regret the past. Thank you very much.